Good evening, Maxborough and Swinton. It's a pleasure to talk to you once again. The first of these two short talks is about building a tellurium. And the first question I'm sure on your lips is, what is a tellurium? So I guess you're familiar with the idea of an orrery giving us a model, a clockwork or a motorized model that tells us how the planets move around the sun. Well, a tellurian is similar to that, but is a much more detailed version showing us the motion of the moon and the earth relative to the sun. So you can see that we have mechanism that will allow us to see the moon going around the earth, the earth is going to be spinning and the earth is tilted. And so we can use a tellurian to get a lot more information about the relative movement of moon, earth and sun. So as well as being a rather nice ornament and a very nice thing to put on your mantelpiece, if you have a large enough mantelpiece, it can be used in principle to demonstrate a number of different factors. It, because of the rotation of the Earth, we can use it to demonstrate day and night. And because the Earth's axis is tilted over, as you can see here at approximately 23 and a half degrees, it can also be used to demonstrate the changing seasons. It can show the lunar phases as the moon goes around the Earth. And because it also takes into account the tilt of the moon's orbit relative to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, it can also show us the existence of lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. So perhaps we first need to remind ourselves why eclipses don't occur every month. This diagram shows that if we take this plane here as being the plane of the Earth around the Sun, the so-called ecliptic, we see that the Moon's orbit is tilted by quite a few degrees, about five degrees. And that means that whenever we have a new Moon, when the Moon is between the Sun and the Earth, quite a lot of the time the Moon's shadow will not hit the Earth because in this particular case, you can see on the right, the Moon is actually above the ecliptic and so the shadow will miss the Earth by going over its North Pole. And on this other side we see the new Moon occurring where the new moon position occurs below the plane of the ecliptic and so the shadow of the moon will miss the earth because it will be further south than the south pole. And the line that joins the points where the plane of the moon's orbit cuts through the plane of the earth orbit, these points are called nodes. And if the new moon or full moon occurs on one of those nodes, then there is a direct line from the sun to the moon to the earth in the case of a solar eclipse or the sun to the earth to the moon in the case of a lunar eclipse. So if we want to know when eclipse happens, we need to know not only when we get a new moon or a full moon, we also need to keep track of where these so-called nodes are, the point at which the moon's orbit crosses the earth's orbit. And if we keep track of where the moon is and where the nodes are, then we can work out if we have an eclipse. And if we also keep track of how far the moon is away from the Earth, because the moon's orbit around the Earth is an ellipse, not a circle, if we keep track of whether the moon is close to the Earth or far away from the Earth, we can calculate whether or not it's going to be an annular eclipse if the disk of the moon doesn't fully cover the disk of the sun, or whether it's a total eclipse. So bearing that in mind, let's have a look at the Tellurian itself. Three different types of month are built into the mechanism. One of them is not, sorry, neither of them, none of them are the sidereal month, because the sidereal month is how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth as seen from an external frame of reference, such as the stars. But when we're thinking about the moon going around the Earth and the Earth going around the sun, the stars are, in essence, irrelevant. We're interested in the illumination of the moon and we're interested in eclipses. So we're not interested in the sidereal month. But we are interested in the synodic month, how long it takes to go from one new moon to the next new moon. And that is dealt with by this particular ring shown by the S there. The synodic month is indicated by how fast that particular gear rotates, as that's the one that carries the moon around with it. And we've just said that if we want to keep track of how eclipses work, we have to keep track of where the nodes are. 
and the draconic month is the length of time it takes the moon to go from one node back to the equivalent node again. And that's not the same as the length of time it takes to go from one new moon to the next new moon. So the draconic month is taken into account by the movement of this. Perhaps you can just about see that this ring is actually inclined relative to the other rings. It's inclined by the five degrees that make sure that the moon sometimes goes above the plane of the ecliptic and sometimes below. And that ring is carried round and rotates at a speed which is slightly different from the synodic month. And finally, we need to take into account of whether or not an eclipse is going to be an annular eclipse or a total eclipse. And that depend, depends on the elliptical nature of the moon's orbit. And so there is a so-called anomalistic month, which means how long does it take the moon to go from one perigee, one closest approach to the Earth, to the next perigee. And that, again, is a different length of time. Now, it's rather difficult with gears to make gears elliptical because, of course, two circles will mesh as they rotate. But if one of those is an ellipse, then the teeth will miss each other. So in this particular model, we don't have elliptical gears. We have circular gears. And the calculation of how long it takes to go from one perigee to the next perigee is calculated and then indicated on a separate little indicator on the side of the tellurium. So that tells us whenever we get an eclipse, we can read off from there. Are we closest in our approach to Earth? Are we close to perigee or are we closer to apogee, the furthest point from the Earth? And hence, are we going to get an annular or a total eclipse? And the mechanism, the teeth on the various gears are such that the synodic, draconic and anomalistic months are correctly accounted for. 29 and a half days new moon to new moon, 27.2 days to go from node to node, rather different length of time, and similar but not the same length of time is how long it takes to go from perigee to perigee. And this is why one eclipse is never quite the same as the next eclipse. Even if we get to the point where the moon is back in the new moon position and we are closest to the uh, and we're at a node in order to give us an eclipse, we're not necessarily at the closest point again because 27.5 day period is not the same as the 27.2 day period. And hence, the moon will be at a slightly different distance from Earth. And hence, the length of the total eclipse will be slightly different. Or perhaps it'll go from being a total eclipse to an annular eclipse, because the distance to the moon will change. So how do you go about building a Tellurian? Well, originally it was done because the individual parts were available by subscription. You could build in weekly parts an entire Tellurian. Part one would be a magazine and a few of the pieces that you need. In this context, a part doesn't necessarily mean one piece. It means a packet which could be one piece or perhaps a small collection of pieces that make the Tellurian. So one week you'd get a magazine and a few bits. The next week you would get another magazine and a few different bits, in this case a small cog, a spring, an arm, a couple of washers, etc. The next week you would get another magazine and more parts, another magazine and more parts, another magazine and more parts, etc. And if you were to collect all 52 parts in one weekly intervals, of course it would take you a year to build up the entire set until you had all 52 magazines and all 52 sets of parts, comprising perhaps 100 or 150 individual uh, pieces of the mechanism. Each magazine might contain a, a few interesting articles about the moon or about the earth or about the sun. But most importantly, the magazines contain the instructions of how to build these things. And the instructions, I must admit, are indeed very clear. For instance, each piece of the instructions comes with a list of the parts that you're going to need for this particular phase of the construction if you decide to build it in parts rather than all at once at the end of your collection. It tells you how many grub screws, how many washers, how many gears you need and which magazine they came with so that you can double check that you've got all the bits before you start constructing this particular part of the assembly. The 
Instructions are in quite clear English. Take the 91 tooth gear, which is part number 15, and attach it to the spindle collar, which is part number 14, and use the following screws to attach them together. It gives you an exploded diagram of how the various parts fit together that you're currently working with. And perhaps even more importantly, you see what it should look like when you've put them all together, the, the final assembly of this particular piece. So if you follow the instructions and you put it together and it doesn't look like this, then clearly you've done something wrong. But I found the instructions were generally very clear. As an alternative to going out and subscribing to the magazine and getting the magazine and a few bits every week for a year, there is an alternative and a much cheaper way of doing it, and that's to find the parts second hand. In other words, there are people who will sell the various parts. For whatever reason, they've decided to collect all of the parts and then perhaps decided not to build it, in which case they've decided to go on to Facebook Marketplace or onto Amazon or onto eBay and decided to sell the parts. You can see that all the parts here are still in their original plastic wrappings, which means effectively, even though you're buying it second hand, the individual parts are effectively mint because they are still sealed in their plastic enclosures. Some people will sell you some of the parts. Some people will sell you all 52 parts. Some will sell you just the, uh, the nuts and bolts, as it were. Some will sell with the magazines as well. Don't worry if you don't have the magazines because there are enough instructions on YouTube that if you get all of the bits, you don't actually need the written instructions in the magazines in order to build them all. So as well as Facebook, people sell parts on eBay, sometimes individual packets of parts, sometimes large collections all sold at the same time. And that means if you want to collect all 52 parts, if you're lucky enough, somebody might be selling all 52 cheaply, more likely they'll only be selling a few. And it's quite a fun bit of detective work to actually try and collect all the 52 parts because this person might be selling parts 5 to 10, this person might be selling parts 12 to 15, this person might be selling 20 parts, this person might be selling two. And it's a question of collecting and finding out who is selling what and trying to collect all the 52 parts that you need. But beware, some people, for instance, end up advertising like this on the right hand side and they say, here's a load of parts and the cost is whatever they decide to charge for these parts. But they don't tell you necessarily which parts they are selling. They don't tell you this is Tellurian parts 27 to 36 inclusive or anything like that. So not only does that mean it's up to you to figure out which part is which, which you can tell because there are pictures of all the parts in the, in the entire series. But you do occasionally find something like indicated on the right hand side where the seller didn't actually know what they were selling. Because when I look at this picture, I can quite clearly see that some of these parts are parts of a Tellurian. And I can recognize quite a few of them, like the sun there and a large ring and the arm on which the earth sits. But some of these I recognize as being parts of the orrery that I showed on the very first slide of this talk. An orrery of the solar system, not a Tellurian of the Earth, Moon, Sun. So this is actually neither a Tellurian nor an orrery. It's half of one and half of the other. So bear in mind, if you bought this job lot on the right hand side and started putting it together, you would end up with a Frankenstein of half Tellurian, half orrery, and I guarantee you it would not work. However, if you can recognize in here the parts you want, then perhaps if they're being sold cheaply enough, it might still be worth buying them, even if it means you get a few duplicate parts which you don't actually need. That's just a question of how you go about collecting all the bits. It might be worth buying a job lot of 20 just to get the three or four parts you want, irrespective of the fact that you've already got the other 16 and you don't actually need duplicates. But hey, that will happen from time to time. When some friends and I decided to build one of these because we're interested in 
constructing things and we're interested in astronomy so we decided to put uh, our heads together and go out and try and find the 52 parts we need to make a tellurium. We did this uh, a few years ago. But along the way we found that we were picking up quite a few duplicate parts and we thought that's not a problem as long as we're buying them cheaply enough it doesn't really matter if we have a few duplicates left at the end of the day. And if it's really a problem well we just put them back on eBay and sell them again. Okay, but as we got close to the 52 that we needed, as we got into the 40s, heading to the high 40s, we thought we're heading towards 52 and we are actually picking up quite a few duplicates. So after a little bit of thinking about it, we thought, oh, what the hell, let's build two of them. In other words, we were close to being fully 52'd on one of them and we decided once we reached 52 we would start building one tellurium and we had enough bits left over that if we collected just a few more parts we'd have enough to build a second tellurium. My friends live in the uh, West Midlands and I live in Merseyside and we decided as a homage to the Gemini North and South telescopes we would call these tellurium South in the West Midlands and tellurium North here on Merseyside. So it took us uh, a few months, but eventually we found enough parts to build two Tellurians. So beware, it does become a little bit obsessive after a while. This is not our collection, but some people advertise on eBay and elsewhere that they do indeed have quite a few partially unfinished orreries and Tellurians. So whether it's addictive or whether it's an obsession is only a matter of uh, relative scale, I suppose. But in this particular picture, it looks like one person has got at least three Tellurians and at least, what is it, half a dozen orreries in the foreground. But that can be an advantage. That means somebody somewhere has probably got all the bits you need. And if you email these people and say, I need part 37 of a Tellurian, it's quite possible they will have spares and will be able to sell you that part, even if you can't find them by trawling Facebook or eBay. So my friends and I decided that once we had collected together all of the 52 parts which we found on a combination of eBay and Facebook. We laid them all out at the table and said right let's have a weekend and put it together. This is going to be fun. So that's all 52 parts. Remember a part as far as these people are concerned means a packet of bits and the packet of bits might be a single large gear for instance or maybe a packet of small screws or washers or cogs and you can see different scales within those various packets. So we started with 52 packets and then we started putting it together. A few hours in the morning, a few hours in the afternoon for a couple of days. So there's the first bit that goes on, the earth angled over at 23 degrees uh, and rotating at the end of an arm, which is the arm that takes it around the sun. We then add the moon going around the earth and then eventually add the sun there on the left hand side. Putting it all together, well you can see here that's the uh, the finished product after a few hours of work. It's not a bad idea to have a few tools at hand. The scissors are simply useful for cutting the pieces out of their plastic enclosures. Small allen key, um, rather useful for some of the smaller grub screws. Needle nose pliers, not strictly necessary, it just sometimes helps to hold on to some of the smaller items with pliers rather than with your fingers. And a small crosshead screwdriver is very useful for some of the smaller screws as well. Notice also that the tellurian here is placed inside a large plastic tray, the sort that you can get in a garden centre. This is simply because when you're putting some of these screws into place it is not impossible that every once in a while you'll drop one of the grub screws and dropping it here onto the plastic tray such that you uh, don't lose the grub screw well that's uh, that's quite a good idea to stop it rolling too far for some of these grub screws they can be in slightly awkward places that's perhaps why a little mirror isn't a bad idea either, just to make it easier to see what's going on when your line of sight is almost obstructed by other parts of the tellurium. But the tray is a good idea to stop anything going on the floor. The last thing you need is a tiny grub screw to end up going on the carpet. 
that's then very difficult to find, of course. Luckily, that never happened. Oh, uh, um, um, I don't know what that photo is doing in there. No, that never happened. So after 10 hours, roughly speaking, 10 hours, that's a morning and an afternoon of a Saturday and a Sunday with lots of cups of tea and coffee and biscuits in between. About 10 hours to put it all together and then a little bit of time to realise that, oh, uh, uh, we haven't done that up quite so tight. Maybe we have to slacken off this grub screw and then move this a little bit and then tighten the grub screw. Maybe that doesn't look at quite the right height. Oh, we've put that upside down. We'll have to take that off, turn it over and put it back. The instructions are very clear, but occasionally we do misread something and put something on upside down and then hopefully it's obvious that it's wrong and we fix it. So it took 10 plus hours to get everything put together. And what you end up with is a beautiful piece of equipment, a beautiful mechanism, which is relatively accurate. It's of course not to scale in terms of the size of the moon, the size of the earth and the size of the sun, but in terms of the motion, it does accurately reflect the motion of the moon around the sun, sorry, the motion of the moon around the earth and the earth around the sun. The sun comes in two versions, uh, both are part of the kit. One is simply a solid piece, but the second one is hollow and there's a light inside and with a couple of button batteries, you can illuminate the sun. That's only for aesthetic effect. It doesn't actually cast accurate shadows because of course the sun is way too big and way too close to give you accurate shadows of the moon on the earth but let me show you what it looks like when it's running. Here's a video of the final version of the Tellurian in motion. It's almost silent. There is just a slight ticking motion, a ticking noise when it's operational. A, it's battery, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's driven from a motor in the base, which is then driven from uh, the mains. And there is a speed control. This is running about as fast as it goes. And you can see the Earth is rotating once in about two seconds or so. Let me just run that video one more time. So if one day is two seconds, it takes about 700 seconds for the Earth to go around the sun. So one year is about a little over 10 minutes. You might also notice that the mechanism also drives the sun itself. So the sun is actually rotating approximately once a month. Um, of course, the sun is a fluid body. It doesn't rotate as a rigid body, but it's nice that they bothered to rotate the sun as well as get the motion of the moon and the rotation of the earth approximately right. Let's just run that one more time before we have a little more close look at some of the mechanism. So remember down here, it's telling us whether we've got an annular eclipse or a total eclipse. And the line here that's inclined, this orbit inclined to the orbit of the Earth is what's allowing us to predict when eclipses occur. Everything is driven off the central axis and then the various chains and gears make sure the motion of the moon is accurately speed. Here's a closer look at some of the internal mechanism. The Earth is off to the left hand side, the Sun is on the right, and the chains are partly there to drive this middle sprocket. Let me just run that again. This middle sprocket which then rotates the Moon around the Earth and rotates the Sun itself. And once it's operational, it can be quite hypnotic. It's only a short video, let's just run that again. It is quite hypnotic to watch the mechanism in motion, not just the way the moon works, but just watching all of the intricate mechanism that you've built. So in summary, it is very rewarding to start with 52 pieces, 52 parts. It's actually quite fun to collect them in the first place, a bit of detective work to find the 52 parts, but having found them, it is enormously satisfying to take those 52 parts with or without the magazines. If you don't have the magazines, remember there are still instructions all over YouTube as to how to put these various pieces together. And then after 10 or more hours, maybe a few days of graft, then you end up with a beautiful model and it is so satisfying to see it working, perhaps with a little bit of fettling just to make sure that everything is as tight as it ought to be and nothing is binding to get the motion as smooth as possible.
Most of the important motion is based on bearings, and whenever two brass features move relative to each other, there's always a nylon washer in between to make sure nothing grinds. The motion at the end of the day is relatively smooth. And it is very satisfying to start with the top left, a table full of bits, and then after a couple of days to end up with a working tellurium. If you fancy giving it a go yourself, here are some web pages. Don't worry about making a note of these. I'll make these available by sending them to Steve and Roy so that you have copies of the slides of this presentation so that you can go and look at these various web pages. The top one is the Eagle Moss distributor who originally sold the uh, Tellurian, but other places uh, make the parts available, either the magazines or the parts or both. Partworks collectibles, for instance, have a number of different things that, uh, that they sell as not the original manufacturers, but are making parts available for anybody who puts these things together. But I found the best place to get all of this stuff was to look secondhand on Amazon or eBay or Facebook, where the is a thriving second-hand market on various second-hand pieces of both orreries and tellurians. So if you fancy giving it a go, I can thoroughly recommend it if you decide to try for yourself to build a tellurian. Thank you for listening.